Let's get into our next story here about AOC. So actually, uh, I think I want to start with this article first. I want to go back and tell, tell you about <clears throat> tell you about AOC's initial response about the pro uh, Palestinian uh, rallies. Now there was a huge one in New York over about I think it was about two weeks ago, and there was this pressure to ask different politicians how they feel about the rallies that are happening. By the way, the rallies are happening across the world. They're increasing, as you guys have seen on the show. So I want to take you back to her response then, and then we're going to fast forward to her present day response in her interview with Mehdi Hassan. Now, this was reported from The Guardian. AOC decries bigotry and callousness of pro-Palestinian rally in New York. So here we go. Now, this is when trying to play both sides doesn't work out so well. Criticizing a pro-Palestinian rally in Times Square in New York City and the aftermath of Hamas attacks on Israel, which left hundreds dead, the progressive congresswoman AOC said it should not be hard to shut down hatred and anti-Semitism where we see it. Let me go ahead here and fast forward. It says the Sunday rally in New York endorsed by members of the Democratic Socialists of America and promoted by the group's New York chapter attracted a crowd of more than a thousand. Some chanted resistance is justified when people are occupied and there were reports of Nazi emblem being shown and Israeli flags burned and trodden on. Now, I didn't see any of those things happen in the video footage that I saw. Just keep that in mind. Amid attacks from Republicans... AOC, a New York representative, said this. So first, oh, wait a minute. Let me read this part because this part is important. Amid attacks from Republicans, AOC, a Democrat New York representative, popularly known as AOC, was among Democrats to condemn the rally. Here's the part I want you to focus on. Attacks from Republicans. So this is an example of AOC caving to the Republican party. So she was attacked by, not by her party, by the Republican party. And so because of those attacks, because of that pressure from the right, AOC essentially caved to what the Republican party wanted. You still want to tell me that this woman is a socialist and a progressive? She caved right to the Republican Party. She went on to say this. Speaking to Politico, she said shutting down hatred and anti-Semitism was a core tenet of solidarity. The bigotry and callousness expressed in Times Square on Sunday were unacceptable and harmful in this devastating moment. So keep that in mind. It also did not speak for the thousands of New Yorkers who were capable at rejecting Hamas horrific attacks, her, excuse me, horrifying attacks against innocent civilians, as well as those grave injustices and violence Palestinians face under occupation. She went on to say, I condemn Hamas attack in the strongest possible terms. No child and family should ever endure this kind of violence and fear. And this violence will not solve the ongoing oppression and occupation in the region. An immediate ceasefire and de-escalation is urgently needed to save lives. Okay. Now, listen to Cori Bush's response. Cori Bush condemned the targeting of civilians. You see the difference here? Targeting of civilians to achieve a just and lasting peace in the Middle East. U.S. government support for Israeli military occupations and apartheid should be ended. So you see the difference between the response that Cori Bush gave where it was very clear that she was calling out the fact that the U.S. government was aiding Israel in reference to continuing apartheid and occupation and compare that to what AOC said, which is where she was trying to walk this tightrope in the middle and trying to both sides it. And I told you guys, there would eventually come a time where there would be an issue where you can't both sides it. So now there has been an interview with AOC and Mehdi Hassan. And now this is important for people to note, obviously, you know, um, Mehdi Hassan is, uh, I believe Muslim, right? 
So just keep that in mind when you watch this interview, but also the fact that AOC has also received backlash from some of her own constituents, some of her own supporters about where she stood in reference to this particular conflict and not going as far as Cori Bush and condemning the occupation and the apartheid. So now she has this interview with Mehdi Hassan and I want you to see, pay attention to this. Pay attention to how AOC has tried to both sides this issue. And sometimes you just got to take a side. Now let's go to Democratic Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who recently met with family members of hostages being held by Hamas and has been calling for a ceasefire. Congresswoman, thanks for coming back on the show. Is it fair for me to summarize your position and the position of some of your fellow progressives that you're calling for Hamas to release the hostages and for Israel and the U.S. to agree to a ceasefire? Correct. Correct. That's absolutely correct. And what would you say to the Israelis who say they suffered a horrific terrorist attack, over 1,400 people killed, many in gruesome ways, children killed, abducted. And so they say they're fighting a war of self-defense, a war that any other country, including the U.S., would fight if they were in the same position. What is your reaction to that line of argument? I think one of the things that's important to recognize about this situation is the asymmetry of what is going on, uh, as well as the collective punishment of what is happening to the Palestinian people at this moment. Hamas has absolutely engaged in horrific attacks. And every single day, uh, there are more details um, that are released about what occurred on October 7th that shocks the human consciousness and, um, and, and shocks our conscience, our collective conscience. However, we do know as well that war crimes do not constitute and are not an appropriate response for other war crimes. Uh, Hamas's hostage taking, uh, their hostage taking of children, of the disabled, elderly civilians are a war crime. But when we are talking about the blockading of water, food, electricity to a population of 2.2 million Palestinians, we are talking about dropping what we're seeing from Human Rights Watch reports and confirmation um, from organizations like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, the dropping and deployment of white phosphorus, which is also a war crime. It is un unacceptable to think that 1,700 ch Palestinian children alone, that their deaths will somehow make up for or justify the violence of what we saw on October 7th. Let's pause here. So you know what I've been noticing for these politicians that are trying to both sides this issue? They're mentioning the fact that water has been blocked, you know, obviously electricity, et cetera. But what they're not mentioning is what happened before that. This did not start October 7th. They're not mentioning the fact that all these years, 95% of the water that's going into Gaza has been dirty water. What happens when you drink dirty water? What happens when you bathe in dirty water? Ask the people in Flint, Michigan, how that works out for you. Obviously, that can cause you to have health issues, if not in the immediate future, later on down the line. That causes all different types of problems. Uh, we were talking about this before, a couple months ago on the show, how cholera actually has had an increase, uptick again in Haiti. Like water, clean water is essential, right? They're not pointing that part out. They're not pointing the part like, like the food and how Israel actually had control over all those resources all this time. So we cannot sit here and pretend like it's just an issue now because they decided to stop it and end the aid when they have been putting restrictions on food and water and electricity all this time. So you have to point that out. You can't just talk about what just happened after October 7th. But again, what AOC is trying to do here is she's trying to walk that tightrope where she can be in the middle instead of taking one side or the other. Now she wants to try to, you know, call out some things to appear to still be progressive to whatever fan base she has left. But at the same time, she's going to try to find a way to support, <clears throat> to support Israel so that she still remains in the good graces of Democrat party leadership. You know, here in Congress, every single year we pass a defense budget and every single year we hear about the precision, the, the sophistication, the technological capacities 
uh, to meet targets with such precise strikes. And yet what we are seeing unfold in Gaza is an indiscriminate bombing campaign. We are seeing the dropping of white phosphorus, an indiscriminate weapon. We are seeing civilian centers being bombed. We are seeing churches. We are seeing thousands upon thousands of people being killed by these strikes. But when people were protesting against those very same things in New York City, your city, AOC was against the rally. You see, this is why I wanted to show you what was said in that article, what she said prior to what she's saying in this interview. And it, uh, it occurs to me, and I think a question that we all must ask ourselves is what price of innocent life is acceptable in terms of targeting Hamas? And are we even receiving, we are receiving daily counts every day by the number of innocent people that are dying. We are not seeing reports on how effective this has actually been in terms of dismantling Hamas. I think it's very important for us to raise that point. And I think it's also very important for us to yes. understand that this is part of a larger intergenerational cycle of violence. So let me pause there for a second. When we talk about innocent life, she talks about, you know, innocent life, like being targeted because of this, we cannot forget the fact that innocent Palestinian lives have been targeted since the occupation. They've been targeted from day one, going all the way back to 1948 ish. They've been targeted from then they were targeted when they were dragged out of their homes and told they couldn't live there anymore. They were targeted when they were basically positioned into the West Bank, positioned into Gaza and told you can only live in these certain areas. And we're going to put a fence around this area and you can't leave the space unless you get special permission from Israel. And that includes people that needed to have certain types of surgeries, as we saw with Anya uh, Parampil's coverage, where they needed to leave that fenced in area in Gaza and they needed to go into Israel to have the surgery that they needed to have to the treatment that they needed to get, which is not available uh, in Gaza. I also want to bring up the, the dirty water issue when we talk about the hospital facilities, obviously hospitals need to have clean water. Like these are kind of things, it's all connected, right? So essentially the people that are living in Gaza, they're basically living in like a ghetto, like a, a ghetto concentration camp where they don't have the resources that they need. So when we talk about targeting innocent lives and concerns about innocent life, this started from the very beginning of the occupation, from the very beginning when they were taken out of their homes. This did not start October 7th. And AOC needs to get that right. Someone who really understands this and gets this right, like from and has been talking about this heavily, and it, it actually cost him his job at CNN. That's Mark Lamont Hill. He's been talking about this from day one. He actually just did an interview with The Breakfast Club where he actually laid all this out. The entire history. So if you haven't seen that episode on The Breakfast Club, check that out. So you mentioned war crimes and Human Rights Watch did this this week, said Hamas should be investigated for committing war crimes in southern Israel, as you said. But also Israel uh, is also being accused of war crimes by both Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. Um, just to be clear, your view is that both sides have been are committing war crimes because 95 percent of your colleagues in Congress won't even call for a ceasefire, let alone accuse Israel of war crimes. I don't see how anyone can look at reputable international organizations confirming the carrying and deployment of white phosphorus um, by the Israeli government, the Israeli military, and say that there is no question here. In fact, Josh Paul, the State Department official that resigned publicly this week, pointed specifically to this issue that the Leahy laws, United States Leahy laws, require the United States to assess if a government is committing war crimes or engaged in gross human gross violations of human rights, and that must be considered in any weapons transfer, transfer or military aid assistance. And from, from an individual whose role directly involved the assessment and the deployment of these weapons and consideration of Leahy, he himself is saying that US law yes. is in his view being violated. And that must be an absolute consideration because when we are talking about the role of democracy and fighting for democracy, the whole case for democracy, it lies upon and, and rests upon 
civil society, okay. rule of law, and the protection of human and civil rights. And we pause here. When AOC says that she doesn't see how anyone can can look at the the claims from the organizations like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and not see how she doesn't understand how anyone can look at that and not see that these are obviously issues. Yes, she does. She knows exactly how they can look at it and see that it's not an issue because their donors tell them it's not one. We'll get into that when we get into the Richie Torres story, but because their donors tell them that it's not an issue. And if you want to keep getting money from us and you want to keep that seat that you have in Congress, you're going to pretend like it's not an issue too. She knows exactly how this works. She's not going to say that to Mehdi Hassan though. By the way, I see they let Mehdi Hassan out of the, uh, out of the cage, huh? They, they let him out. He's allowed to do his show again now. We must make our case more so in wartime than almost any other time to make the so, distinguishment of what makes us different. So Congresswoman, your critics would say that it's all well and good calling for a ceasefire, but that doesn't deal with the problem of Hamas, doesn't protect Israeli civilians from future Hamas attacks. And I wonder, for example, what is your response to Senator Schumer, Majority Leader Schumer, who suggested in remarks that Punchbowl published on Friday that those of you progressive in the House who are calling for a ceasefire or suggesting Israel is attacking hospitals are basically taking, he said, quote, Hamas's position. You know, let me pause here for a second. Why is the focus on protecting the state of Israel and not the focus on protecting Gaza and the West Bank and Lebanon and Syria? Why is the focus not who is in position of power? This is something I always come back to. Ask yourself this question. Who is in the position of power who has been in the position of power for the last couple of decades, who controls the resources, who controls the air. So why are, why is the focus on the people who are not in position of power instead of the people who are in the position of power? And there's no way Mehdi Hassan can't tell me that that wasn't a scripted question that they told him to ask. Because Mehdi Hassan knows better. He knows better. He's been very vocal about this issue before in the past and being on the side of the Palestinian people. So it seems to me someone got to Mehdi. I, um, I have great respect for Senator Schumer and we enjoy a, a, a very strong working relationship. This is an area, however, of disagreement. Um, I would say that if we want to see um, how this is going. We can just look back at the many different cycles of violence and response. And I, I do not believe that it is a, it's, it's absolutely not a defense of Hamas in order to criticize um, this current approach, this indiscriminate violent approach. So but you, you fell right into that trap when you criticized the rally in New York City. So you guys see the problem with this, this situation? You see now AOC is getting that same criticism that she gave to protesters that were protesting in New York. Now she's getting the same criticism from Chuck Schumer. Mm -hmm. 1,700 children are dead. And when I think about the political aims of violence, the material aims of violence often involve the destruction of human life um, and much of the horror that we've seen. But many of the political aims of violence is to further radicalize and entrench both parties into further violence. And when we see people radicalized uh, to dehumanize the Palestinian population as a result of Hamas, this is part of the goal of that political violence. And when we see uh, the dehumanization of Israeli families, um, as a result of, of this, this is part of the political aim. And we have to be able to get ourselves to break this cycle because Hamas you would accept, and terrorism. Congresswoman, you would, you would accept yes, that a I ceasefire, just, though, would leave Hamas in place. You would accept that's a cost of saving civilian lives in Gaza. I think in the immediate sense, we have to have a pause. 
in what is going on. As you mentioned, only 14 trucks have made through in humanitarian yeah. aid. We are talking about a Today. full blockade of water for a population of 2.2 million people, 1.1 million people in, in northern Gaza. And we're supposed to think that 14 trucks is going to somehow in any way in any way address what is happening in you, terms of the, the starvation, the famine, the thirst that is happening. People, I mean, we, we are now at a state I, where. But this is still going to be an issue. So here's the thing. I, I've been saying for a long time, I agree. Yes, obviously there needs to be a ceasefire, but there also needs to be discussion of what happens after that. What happens after the ceasefire? Because the thing is, the Palestinian people now are stuck living in the rubble. And I don't know if you've seen the pictures, but I can't show them. But if you look on Twitter, you'll see the pictures of what is left of Gaza. Stuck living in the rubble of what is left of Gaza. And then they still are stuck depending on Israel giving the resources to them. They're still stuck with dirty water. They're still stuck with maybe three hours of electricity a day, if even. They're still stuck with that. They're still stuck with the fact that they can't move freely, that they're trapped in this open air prison. That isn't changing. So to me, it's that's step one. Step one, call for a ceasefire. But what is step two? The Palestinian people need to have a right to dignity. And they need to have some type of a solution. We've talked about this before, about a two-state solution at this point in time is not going to work because there are too many settlements. There's too many of them. So this goes back to the whole one-state solution idea again. But what is going to happen? Because this is going to spread. And I want to be very clear when I discuss this. One of the things I noticed when we spoke to the Palestinian network is that the goal is not just to try to push out the Palestinian people, what's left of the Palestinian people. The goal is also to expand to other places like Jordan. And I honestly believe I wouldn't be surprised if the goal is to expand to a country like Lebanon, which they're bombing right now, or Syria, which they're also bombing right now. The goal is not just to stop with where they are right now. If that was the goal, they wouldn't be doing what they're doing now. So this is what people have to pay attention to. I don't, I never thought this, that the goal was just to end there. Think about it this way. When Europeans came to North America and settled here, colonized, pushed out the indigenous people, killed the indigenous people, killed some of them, pushed some of them out, put them on reservations, et cetera. We all know that long history. Was the goal just to colonize the Northeast? Was the goal just to, oh, let's just, just take this eastern part of the land, just the eastern part of America? No, the goal was to expand. That's the thing. When we talk about colonialism, when we talk about groups colonizing, the goal is never just to, let me just capture this one small town or this one city. The goal is always expansion. So the question that people need to ask, what else or what other countries are they intending to expand to? And by they, again, I'm not talking about the Jewish people. I'm talking about the state of Israel. Think about it. These people are living under an occupied force. They're living in a militant state where they have militarized police. The IDF is not just threatening the Palestinian people. The IDF, there's videos of the IDF threatening people who are Jewish that side with the Palestinian people or people who are Jewish that are anti-Zionist, they threaten them too. So what is the goal? And this is why we say, when we say it's a humanitarian crisis, we've been saying this for years because we knew that this would spread. And if this continues to spread, what happens to everybody else? What happens to the people in Lebanon? What happens to the people in Syria? What happens to the people in Jordan? Egypt's right there. Egypt is right next to Gaza. So there needs to be more than just a ceasefire. What comes next? And the U.S. government needs to stop aiding this behavior.
there is risk of cholera and other types of waterborne disease. Yes. And I mean, what, 14 uh, trucks of what, bottled on that, water? On, on that note about what's happening to them, I can't help but notice that almost, you mentioned dehumanization, all or almost all of the at least 18 House Democrats who've called for a ceasefire in Gaza are people of color. How much of the congressional indifference to Palestinian life in Gaza, the refusal in DC to acknowledge sometimes the humanity and the innocence, not to mention suffering of ordinary Gazans, how much of that is driven by the fact that they're Arabs or they're mostly all Muslims or they don't look like us, do you think? And not all of them, because there are some sellouts like Richie Torres and Hakeem Jeffries, who, again, will go into the donors in, in a bit. And you'll see why they have the position that they have in reference to this issue. I mean, I will say that. I have long found the ignoring and sidelining of Palestinians in the U.S. House of Representatives, the, Palest the humanity of Palestinian populations uh, in the five years that I've been in Congress quite shocking. Um, this is not something that is new to many of us. I have engaged alongside many of my colleagues from Betty McCollum's bill on uh, the detention, you know, conditioning aid and making sure that it's not going to the detention of children uh, to, to just raising the, the routine human rights uh, issues. We've been trying to raise the alarm bells around this for years. And there has been virtually no acknowledgement. Were you trying to raise the acknowledgement around this by supporting to fund the Iron Dome? Because if you were if you were really trying to remember when she cried and she had those tears because, oh, I don't want to do this. And she cried to Nancy Pelosi. Were you trying to raise the alarm about the situation with the Palestinians are dealing with? Were you trying to raise that alarm when you guys voted the way that you did in reference to the Iron Dome? No, you weren't trying to raise the acknowledgement about it, because if you were, you would have voted the other way. The United States House of Representatives about the, the, the extreme plight and human, continued human rights violations of the Palestinian people for years. I think I found it alarming. I found it shocking. I found it shocking when in 2019 or, or, or 2020 in our first term, uh, of the House of Representatives when a prime minister Netanyahu banned two United States sitting members of Congress from coming to Israel. Uh, Representatives yes. Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar banned two members of the United yes. States Congress from entering the country that my own colleagues did not seem to say or do much of anything. That should be so, an affront to our entire government and country. So you mentioned your colleagues in the Congress. Before we run out of time, I've got to ask you about the House itself. You have no speaker right now. The Republicans defenestrated Kevin McCarthy, couldn't agree on Steve Scalise or Jim Jordan. Now Byron Donalds, congressman from Florida, wants to be speaker. What do you make of him? Um, I, you know, he's only served one term in the US House of Representatives. He last thing that he did in the oversight committee was attempt to submit falsified evidence uh, to an impeachment hearing. I think it helps to know where all the bathrooms are before you run for the U.S. House of Representatives <laughs> personally. And I think uh, it helps to have some real experience in one of the most complex uh, legislative bodies in the world before you try to run it. We'll go ahead and stop there. So what's really interesting to me is. You heard the position that AOC has, that there should be a ceasefire. AOC has publicly endorsed Joe Biden. So if Joe Biden does not call for a ceasefire, if he does not withdraw that aid from Israel, is AOC going to take back her endorsement for Joe Biden? No, she's not. This is how you know she's full of it. This is how you know that she's playing people. This is how you know that she's being fake. Again, like I said, she walks in the middle on a lot of issues so she can be safe on both sides and by both sides. I mean, like with, with the squad members, her base, the people that really like supported her and then also Democrat leadership. That's what she does. But you have to look at people's actions. When she says that we were raising the alarm about this for years, you weren't raising the alarm about it when you voted to fund the iron dome. None of them were none of them. Even the ones that voted present, you weren't trying to raise the alarm about it then. 
You're not trying to raise the alarm about it if you continue to endorse Joe Biden. I said the same thing in reference to Rashida Tlaib. Same thing. Same thing. So we'll see how much you care about those Palestinian innocent civilians come next year, come 2024 in this election time.